Hey there, Brainiacs. You know how much I love astrocytes, right? My favorite starry cells are underappreciated by scientists and non-scientists alike, and I'm on a mission to convince the world of their importance. But recently, I've been learning that there may be brain cells that are even more underappreciated. We've talked about different kinds of glia, like astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and microglia, but we haven't talked about the brain's blood vessels. And like so many things about the brain, these blood vessels are pretty special. This week, we're talking talking about the blood-brain barrier, the gateway between your brain and the rest of your body. And I've asked my friend and blood-brain barrier expert, Katie Profaci, to join me to help explain this topic. Hi there! Katie is also a graduate student of neuroscience at UCSD and an avid science communicator, leading the organization of ComSciCon SD and writing for Neurite SD, our local student-run blog. You can check it out by clicking the link up there. And for her thesis research, Katie is studying the blood-brain barrier, or BBB and particularly how problems with the BBB might be involved in neurological disorders like multiple sclerosis. So Katie, what is the BBB? Aren't all of our blood vessels basically the same? Good question, but no. <laughs> <laughs> the blood-brain barrier sounds like it might just be a wall between the brain and the rest of the body, but it's not. The barrier comes from the endothelial cells. That is the cells that make up the blood vessel walls. So what's so special about the brain's endothelial cells? Well, in most of your body, blood vessels kind of look like this. Ions and small molecules from the blood can squeeze in between the endothelial cells and move into the tissue. But the ones in the BBB are different. Their most important feature is the tight junction. Basically, this means that there's almost no space between neighboring endothelial cells in the blood vessels kind of like this, which prevents molecules and proteins from squeezing between the endothelial cells to get into the brain. And brain endothelial cells also have way fewer leukocyte adhesion molecules, which are basically little gates for immune cells to get from the blood into the tissue. And that's okay because as you know, the brain has its own immune cells called microglia that patrol for infection. And there are other cells that help support the BBB, like the pericytes, which play a key role in the formation and maintenance of the BBB, and astrocytes, or specifically their end feet, which wrap around the brain's blood vessels to transport nutrients to the neurons. So all these special abilities of the endothelial cells we're talking about make the BBB a barrier. It's much harder for anything to get in or out of the blood vessels of the brain than it is anywhere else. But that seems like kind of a pain, doesn't it? Building special barriers between the brain and the blood? Well, the brain is pretty delicate. As you know, we don't really grow many new neurons as we age, so protecting the ones we have is really important. On top of that, our brain cells are pretty fragile. And since they're so critical for keeping us awake and walking and talking, they require a lot of extra protection. So the blood-brain barrier is like the wall at Helm's Deep in The Lord of the Rings. It's the brain's first line of defense against orcs. I mean infections, which could potentially be deadly if they got into the brain. Right, but actually the BBB is really important not just to protect from infection, but just for normal healthy brain function. Because the brain uses chemical signals to send messages, it's really, really important for the brain to maintain a careful homeostasis. And by that, I mean it needs to keep a very precise balance of ions in the fluid surrounding the cells so that the neurons can fire action potentials and none of the chemical signals get confused. The BBB helps to maintain that homeostasis by keeping out most ions and molecules, which could throw a big wrench into things. So if the blood-brain barrier is so impermeable, how does the brain get all the nutrients it needs? That's part of what makes the BBB so amazing. It's exclusive, but it's designed so that the important stuff can still get in, like a really good bouncer. <laughs> Certain gases, like oxygen, can still diffuse through the blood vessels, and then the endothelial cells have specialized transporter proteins to help carry glucose and other important molecules across the barrier. In fact, endothelial cells in the brain have more mitochondria than endothelial cells in other parts of the body, probably because they have to use a lot more energy to transport helpful molecules while blocking the harmful ones. Hmm. It makes sense that the brain needs all of these special tools. It's a pretty delicate organ. But what happens when something goes wrong with the BBB? What kinds of effects does that have on the brain? When the BBB dysfunctions, a lot of bad things can happen. 
If ionic concentrations get thrown off, neurons might start firing willy-nilly, mm. um, or not be able to fire when they're supposed to. Extra fluid gets into the brain, causing swelling, and many more immune cells can get into the brain, which can be especially bad in autoimmune diseases, when immune cells get wrongly programmed and instead of attacking affections, start to attack parts of your own tissue. Unfortunately, there are quite a few diseases in which the BBB is known to dysfunction, including multiple sclerosis, stroke, epilepsy, and traumatic brain injury. And if you imagine a disease like a set of dominoes, with the first domino being the trigger of the disease and the last domino being the death of the neurons, we believe that BBB dysfunction is one of the early dominoes. And if we prevent that domino from falling, we might prevent the rest of them from falling and mitigate lots of the consequences of the disease. However, there's still a lot to discover in terms of what exactly happens on a molecular level in the endothelial cells when the barrier is dysfunctioning. I am working on trying to figure out what those molecular changes are. Ultimately, I hope that we might be able to prevent them. If we could find a way to reduce BBB dysfunction, this might help reduce the long-term symptoms in a wide range of neurological diseases. It's incredible that something as simple as the blood vessels in our brains could be such a key part of so many neurological conditions and disorders. As we're learning, the brain is a lot more complex than you might think if you're only studying neurons. And like so many of the brain's underappreciated glial cells, we still have a lot of work to do before we fully understand the BBB and its role in our brain. But researchers like Katie and her colleagues in the Daneman lab are starting to figure it out. Katie, thanks so much for joining us for this episode. We really appreciate your expertise. Thanks so much for having me. Where can our viewers find you? <laughs> Probably in the lab. <laughs> but you can find some of my neuro writing at neurisd.org. You can check that link up in the corner or check out the links in the description to find Katie's work. <laughs> thanks for watching this episode of Neurotransmissions. If you like this video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button and make sure you subscribe to see the next collaboration we do with our awesome scientist friends. Head over to Patreon to see some photos of Katie and her lab hard at work studying the BBB. Until our next transmission, I'm Ali Astrocyte. Over and out.